you. So um, I'm going to be talking to you today about the research I did as a master's student at uh, Cal State University, Northridge. And I studied bryophytes along 3,000 meter gradient, and that was done in Sequoia National Park. Um, I identified species within plots, and then along with their identifications, I was able to get the number of species that were in the plots. And I also took down ecological descriptions of their niche as well. So this was really, um, this type of work and along such a long gradient was one of the first studies that was done like this, and especially in California. So when I say California, um, for example, in like the terrestrial vegetation of California, there's no treatment for bryophytes, and we think bryophytes deserve the same type of treatment, where you have descriptions of the species and also um, something of their ecologies as well. So the interesting part about it for me is that when you do this with the bryophytes, you get a di very different story from what you would get with the vascular plants, and that's namely because they have a very different biology. And one big difference is that they are dry, when they're dry, they are dormant. So we have this moss here, Dendroalcea abitina, and you can see it in its dry state here. So this is dormant. And then if a rain comes along, or um, there's fog, or if you pour your water bottle on it, then it will, it will rehydrate and it will resume its metabolic activity. Um, so this desiccation tolerance creates niches that are heavily influenced by the microsite's regime of wetting and drying. So um, bryophyte occurrence is also heavily determined by this, the particular pattern of wetting and drying. So how do mosses do in the Mediterranean, which is so at the base of migrating, we had a Mediterranean region. So for a non-biologist, you might think of the Mediterranean region as a dry place. Um, but they actually do very well. The niches are saturated in these lower elevations. When I did my study, you can see the mosses here. So this is an oak buckeye woodland, and you can see them blanketing over the rocks. And for a moss, in the summertime, um, they're dormant. And then you go into the cool, moist, mild winters, and they resume metabolic activity. And from the moss perspective, the Mediterranean region is a fairly wet place. Okay, so. <clears throat> Along with the descriptions of the species, I also looked at changes in species number across elevation, and that was kind of the, the more concrete study in my thesis. And so my study objectives were to compare bryophyte diversity and those descriptions of the niche and how, those, um, how that changed across elevation. So in Sequoia, we went from the foothills in the Mediterranean all the way up to the Alpine where the bryophytes are, are mostly under snow during the winter. And so just to kind of give you an idea of what it's like in Sequoia, so with increasing elevation, you have decreasing temperature, and then precipitation peaks around the conifer zone, but as you increase in elevation, there's an increasing fraction that would be falling as snow. So in the foothills, you're mainly getting precipitation in the form of rainfall, and as we go up, that's changing to snow. So based on the previous work that was done in different locations on uh, what climactic patterns are associated with high species richness, and also knowing the physiology of bryophytes themselves, I hypothesized that with increasing elevation, climate becomes more stressful, and bryophyte species richness and cover should decrease uh, with increasing elevation, um, as fewer species would be able to tolerate the climate. <clears throat> but I also took down descriptions of the species niches. So what I'd like to talk to you about today is the wetness of the microsite. So how did the wetness of the microsite affect species richness along the gradient? I also looked at shade, so the shadiness of the microsite, how did that affect richness along the gradient? I looked at incline, um, so the incline of the substrate, whether it was vertical or horizontal, and what type of substrate, whether you were on something like rock or wood or soil. All right, so but for wetness, um, considering the the wetness tendency of the microhabitat, I hypothesized that in dry microsites, species richness and cover should decrease with, with increasing elevation. So that stress of the climate might still be felt in dry microsites, whereas richness and cover in wet microsites should remain consistent. And again, that would have to do with the overall physiological stress in those microsites. All right, so what did I find? So, uh, this is just considering elevation, so the elevation on the bottom in winters, and then species richness 
here. And every uh, dot is a plot. And I did approximately 250 plots. And they're 25 meters square each. So you can see that uh, there is a, a decrease with increasing elevation as far as species richness per plot. Um, so you have generally higher species richness in the lower elevations. And then as you get up into those higher regions, species richness drops. Now this is just considering elevation alone. So what happens when we consider the wetness of the microsite? Okay, so in this graph, again, every bubble is a plot, but in this case, since we're considering elevation here and wetness here, species richness is reflected in the size of the bubble. So the larger the bubble, the greater number of species were in that plot. And then what does wetness mean? Well, wetness was tailored to be bryophyte specific, so it's not necessarily the, the wetness of the plot at the time, but it's the capacity of the microsite to dry out. And so in a plot that was uh, that scored, let's say, around four, the majority of the bryophytes were in uh, microsites that would remain wet, consistently wet, and, and usually for at least a season. Like, let's say I sampled a stream bank. I would find a lot of wet microsites in those locations. Versus something like a two, the majority of bryophytes in those plots were in places that dried very quickly. So let's say something like an exposed rock outcrop. All right, so how does this make a difference um, as we increased in elevation and sampled our plots? So you can see that in the wetter microsites, species richness remains fairly consistent across elevation. And then as you go into the drier microsites, there's a difference. So you get all of these small bubbles over here. So in the lower elevations, they're doing fine the niches are, are filled in dry microsites. And then as you increase into higher elevations, you have a much fewer number of species in those locations. Okay, so, so both of those hypotheses that I had, I found evidence for both of those are both supported. Um, so in general, with increasing severity of climate that's associated with elevation, we had a decrease in the number of species. But there was an exception to that. In wet microsites, that wasn't the case, but that's a meaningful exception if you consider the overall stress of the microsite. And if you consider something like mosses in a stream versus in a rock outcrop, in a stream, whether you're in low elevation or high elevation, at least at some point during the season, they're receiving continuous wetness. Versus something like a rock outcrop down in the low elevations, during the summertime, they're dry, and in the wintertime, it's mild conditions, mild temperatures, you have fog and rainfall, so they're exposed to fairly consistent wetness, even if you're in something like a rock outcrop. Now, you take that, that same time in the winter up at higher elevations, and now they're under snow, so they're dormant. And then um, when summer rolls around, those microsites might be too, just too dry, because mosses need at least some period of the day where they can be wet and photosynthesized, and they, they need a certain period of time to do that. Okay, so along with that work that I did comparing the Mediterranean regions, the drier foothills to higher elevation non-Mediterranean climates, we also uh, uh, took a look at the California Mediterranean and we compared it to other Mediterranean regions. Mm -hmm. so, so Paul and I um, kind of cataloged the California flora and compared it to Iberica, which would represent Spain and Portugal, Chile, and then as kind of a baseline expectation, uh, we included Eastern North America. So Eastern North America is a place that's, that's near and touching California. Um, what percentage of the California flora do you find in Eastern North America for mosses? Well, it's uh, approximately 55%, and this is just for moss, by the way. But then if we look in Iberica, across the Atlantic, they're sharing California shares 57% of its moss species in that region. So you're finding 57% of the same species, and you actually also find them in similar locations as well. So they're kind of doing the same things in um, the Mediterranean regions in Spain. And that's kind of not the case for Chile. So not exactly sure what's going on with Chile. It could be that they can't get there. It could be that they haven't had time. Or it could be that the, the Mediterranean conditions um, that are meaningful to bryophytes are not found in that location. Um, 
So, so there's a difference here. Okay, so then kind of back to the descriptions of species. So while we were doing our work, um, Paul and I took lots of photographs of the species in the field, and so I have them titled here. Um, this kind of information we could do for at least 100 of the common species that we found along the gradient. Um, and so I'm going to show you nine of those, and they're grouped by elevation regions. So this is down in the foothills in the lower elevations. And so first we have Dendroalcea abiatina. So it's a large moss, and it's found growing on things like oak trunks um, down in the oak woodlands, the oak buckeye woodlands. And it kind of curls over like this when it's dry. And then Pleuridium subulatum. So if you're walking along on a trail and it was like a, a flat place, you might see these tiny orange sporophytes, and those are the recessed sporophytes of Pleuridium. It's an ephemeral moss. And then Alawina ambigua. So this is a thick leaf moss also found in um, compact soils down in the foothills. All right, and then moving on to the conifer zone. So if you were looking at dead wood, what would you find? So maybe like on something like a downed sequoia log, where it, the sequoia logs are very large, so you can find these guys in pretty high cover in those places. So you have Alicomium androgenum. And these are not sporophytes, these are gemophores up at the top, and they contain uh, clusters of jenny. And then Orthodicranum taricum. So it kind of has a grassy appearance to it, and if you run your finger along it, the leaf tips break off and those act as sexual papules. And then Dicranum oisea serrata. So it has a tightly curled crispate leaf, and it also has these uh, like many numerous yellow sporophytes. All right, and then some bryophytes of higher elevations. So all of these are common to very wet places. Um, Artremia ithyphila. So found on rock, or also sometimes on soil, in crevices, or on stream banks. And all of the mosses in this family have this very rounded sporophyte. And then Torchula hopiana can be found on rock and also sometimes soil over rock, um, maybe in a moist place where it's in the shade of a boulder. And then Hygrogramia mollis, so this can be found in wet rock seepages. Okay, so, so just in kind of in conclusion, some of the things that I thought were important <coughs> takeaway messages. Mosses don't hate the Mediterranean climate, but they're actually flourishing in those places. And they see it as a wet place because they're dormant during the summertime. Um, with increasing elevation, we found that mosses in dry spots, like in rock outcrops, tend to decrease. But that's not the case for mosses in a wet place, like in a stream or in a seepage. Those uh, do not change in species number. They do change though in the identity of the species that you find. And then, um, so as far as like what can we do with the identities of those species, hopefully we'll provide a descriptive contribution as far as the ecologies of the species go. Also for higher level groupings, um, such as genera and families, identifying adaptive zones along the elevation gradient, and um, identifying guilds of species in particular regions. <clears throat> and then finally, in comparison to other Mediterranean regions, um, mosses tell a different story from that of angiosperms. So if angiosperms tell a story of different species converging on similar strategies in Mediterranean climates, mosses tell a story of long distance dispersal. They've dispersed by spores, um, so they're capable of traveling very far distances. And so you find a high number of species in the same places kind of doing the same thing. Okay, so with that said, I'm showing my financial support, which includes the California Native Plant Society. Thank you.